Thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, for being here uh, today. It is my great pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, friend first, uh, Chiara Battisti from the University of Verona. So Chiara Battisti is Associate Professor of English Literature in the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature at the University of Verona. Her research interests include intermediality, fashion studies, gender studies, disability studies, health humanities and law, literature and culture. And uh, in these areas, she has published volumes and articles in Italy and abroad. Chiara Battisti is a member of the Italian Society for English Studies. I'm not going to read that in, English, in, uh, in Italian. Uh, she is also a member of the Center for European Modernism Studies and a member of the European Society for the Study of English essay that we all know. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us after two years when we have postponed <laughs> our visit because of the COVID crisis. And the floor is yours. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank my friend and colleague, Professor Pascal. We have worked together so long and so intensely in these um, last two years, always online, and it is a real pleasure to be here in presence. So it has really a special value. And I also would like to thank you all for being here and all the scholars of the Klima group for including me in this uh, impressive cycle of seminars uh, intersections. So, so in my lecture today, I will analyze Angela Carter's short story, Tiger's Rider. Uh, it is part of the collection of short stories of the Bloody Chamber. And I will use the critical tools of my fashion studies. So in the first part of the lecture, I will uh, briefly, very briefly, introduce the, uh, the intersection between fashion and fiction. Then um, I will move, uh, move my focus to postmodern rereadings um, of fairy tales, because The Tiger's Bride is a rereading uh, of a fairy tale. It is a rereading of The Beauty and the Beast. And then I will finally focus on The Tiger's Bride. So <clears throat> I would like to start the first part, the one in which I will start to introduce the connection between fashion and fiction, with this uh, quotation by Oscar Wilde. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearance. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the visible. So I have decided to start um, my reflection um, with this aphorism by Oscar Wilde because it introduces the idea of appearance, which is very often associated with the concept of clothing and with the word of fashion, and with the same implication of superficiality. And the quotation is important because it highlights that appearance is not, uh, it is not only a matter of external surfaces of, of the self, but it is also an important index of personal identity and um, of social and legal identity. So, dress and appearance have a representative value, becoming resources within cultural and social structures, precisely because the purpose, as you can read here, the, pur the purpose they serve in social differ differentiation and social integration, the, psycho um, the psychological needs they are sat satisfied, and not least of all, their implication for modern economic life. So, since fashion doesn't refer simply to clothes, but to clothes in relation to body, identity and society, exploring the, which, uh, the ways in which clothing performs in literature and culture implies recognizing that our material, political, social, psychological and also intellectual lives are woven into the fabric of fashion. <coughs> So, as um, the aphorism by Oscar Wilde reveals, fashion and clothing are far deeper than skill deep, and indeed have affected religion, morals, sex, marriage, and most of all, our social activities and institutions through the ages. It is precisely this consideration which has um, led to the codification of the critical lens of fashion theory. The term fashion theory 
refers to an interdisciplinary field that sees fashion as a meaning system within which cultural and aesthetic portrayals of the clothed body are produced. Fashion studies uh, and fashion, fashion studies critics apply concepts from a variety of disciplines, cultural studies, women and gender studies, anthropology, queer theory, feminist theory, social, um, sociology, social psychology, and so they uh, apply concept from all these disciplines in order to take the seemingly repetitive act of dressing oneself um, every day and apply it to study everything from the micro level of um, levels of identity and self-concept to the macro level of power relations and the, the hierarchy of social systems. The interdisciplinary approach to fashion theory creates the possibility of drawing upon the humanities, including film, literature, performing arts, philosophy and photography, which in turn make the fashion system a special dimension of material culture, of the history of the body and of the theory of perception. The body and the dress body thus turns out to be text places of existence where the signs are traced by the practices of the social and legal system. It is wor worth recording at this point the etymological origin of a term used, um, or at least used in the past, as a synonym of uniform, in Italian divisa and in French divise, I think, um, which originated in the Latin verb divisare in its sense of dress and allegorical phrase or motto. The uniform then will not only be the costume in a social cultural syntax that defines it within the sphere of the ritual functions of the dress in traditional cultures, but it also mm, is an actual principle of behavior written on one's own body. So trace the idea of writing with the use of clothes a principle, a motto on the body. So this example, together with the recurring parallels between the textile and language and the use of textile metaphors in written texts, literature and language, re re reveals um, an, um, the awareness of a century-old link between text and texture, often, um, very often making the textile a structural indicator, indication of other textual levels and intersections. And in this sense, I cannot but quote um, Roland Barthes, and here's the pleasure of the text, in which um, Barthes um, um, underlines the, the connection between text and tissue, and uh, he says that we are now emphasizing in the tissue the generative idea that the text is made is worked out in a perpetual interweaving. So the idea of interweaving of different threads. <coughs> so as you see, this uh, idea and, and this connection between fashion on the one hand and uh, fiction is there. So the text, as outlined by Barth, is a tissue stemming from an interweaving in a relationship of mutual influence between text and culture. So if the body and the dress body become, become texts, they are texts precisely, precisely because they are the places of existence of the signs traced by social practices. So my point is that literature can demonstrate how dress shapes and is shaped by social, economic and legal processes and uh, by social, economic and legal phenomena. Um, and by phenomena such as time, space, gender, class, power, and religion. In fact, literature arises out of a specific cultural context. It depicts political, social, and cultural situations. So literature is grounded in language, but language also has a metaphorical value that extends to other forms of expressions. And among these metaphorical images, we may also include clothing, because as I have already pointed out, clothes sh shapes the individuals and represents the narration of their being in the world. So dress can be seen as a metaphor for language, 
which creates a web of meaning. We are what we wear. Clothing functions, um, clothing function as a narration, an expression of the self. It is the actual presenting of the self to the world. It constitutes one of the means um, a person uses to imprint himself or herself on the world. It is a sort of livery that indicates our social uh, condition. It is also a negotiation between what word fashion, that is to say, the abstract idea of perfection imposed, and the image that each single person strives to achieve. If clothing mm, is, on the one hand, a cultural discourse, and clothes are a text which uh, must be read and interpreted, then literature... I'm sorry, I need to... Uh, sorry, it's just... Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, if clothing uh, is a cultural discourse, and if clothes are a text which must be read and interpreted, then uh, we can also say that literature conveys emotions and feeling about clothes that can highlight character and further the plot of a play or a novel. Fashion itself can be said to produce fiction. So, following Riviero, we can argue that fashion can be understood as fiction since it functions as a narration of an idea, as attention towards an idea. But if fashion is about idealization, dress, clothes, the very material we put on, on our bodies, are images communicating more subtly um, than most objects and commodities, precisely because of the intimate relationship to our bodies and the self. The full dress is about the actual presenting of the self, which is always a type of constructing the self, both revealing and masking part of it. As Bart uh, has pointed out, and um, as I have quoted above, dress is also language, part of a social system of signs. So, for example, white clothes may denote purity and virginity, and black can be used to represent formality, uh, drama or death. But we must also consider that color can communicate different emotions to different individuals. And part of this communication is culturally determined by, by a specific culture. So different cultures assign, assign sometimes completely different meanings to um, the same color. In most Western countries, for, for example, white is the color for bright, in the East, it is the color for funeral. And if you think uh, about literature um, and um, this idea of the different value of white, and like I can mention, uh, White Sargasso Sea, uh, which is a reading uh, of the novel uh, Jane Eyre, in which uh, the idea of white is perceived by, um, by, um, mm, uh, by Werther, for example, as negative because uh, white is, con uh, is connected with the light and uh, with uh, the, the, the heat, while um, black is connected with the shadow, and so it is connected with the positive uh, element. So as you see, we can have different meanings according to the different uh, culture to which a person uh, belongs. So clothing is a cultural discourse, and as such, it must be read and interpreted. And as a form of fiction, fashion and dress can be said to constitute a power technology serving political um, designs. So in this sense, we can say that um, fashion can um, consort with the hegemonic norms and domination. It's regulating force, insights, conformity, but sometimes resistance. To adopt a style or a uniform is to choose a socio-economic milieu and the future. Um, I have um, um, I have um, introduced in the PowerPoint this uh, painting by William Ogard, and it, um, with many others, demonstrates how fashion can describe social identity and how fashion has always raised questions of social identity. So the painting um, here, as other paintings of, uh, of Hogarth, can describe a woman downfall from sick to, to cotton, or a young man's um, social rise 
to the cards of his coat. So we can describe the social evolution of a character thanks to the use of, of, of clothing. And in the new middle class world of the 19th century, dress was the most obvious signal of uh, order and of hierarchy. It was the expression of individual taste within social limits, the marker of ambition, of self-respect and respect for others. And in novels, all of these find, find some of its um, most subtly um, and ambiguous um, descriptions. And uh, here I can um, quote Bazaar, um, who in Lost Illusions um, writes, the question of costumes is one of enormous importance for those who wish to appear to have what they do not have, because that is often the best way to getting at it later on. So the importance of, of dress, the importance of appearance, in order to obtain um, um, a new social position. As a form of fiction, fashion and dress can be said to constitute also gender technology, working in ways similar to those of films, television, and other, and other powerful frameworks and mechanisms that strives to mold individuals and gender, uh, into gender beings. Like other fictions, fashion can also be understood as a counterpoint to dominant discourses of gender, sex, and sexuality even when seen to reinforce the dualist uh, differences, it actually transgresses them by laying there their constructed nature. So in any case, fashion is and can be considered as a gender technology. So as said, this is a very short introduction to fashion studies, just to give you an idea of the many different elements that you can analyze through um, and through the critical filter of fashion studies. And now I move to the second part uh, of my lecture, that is to say, to the idea of a postmodern reading of fairy tales, because as said, um, we are dealing with a reading. Um, so um, in, um, the title of our ride is a reading of a fairy tale. So having briefly into the ABC of um, the relationship between fashion and fiction, I uh, now move to the short story of Angela Carter. So, um, and in order to do this, I will, um, I will first uh, consider um, the postmodern reading of the fairy tales. But um, I have another quotation with which I would like to, to start this part, and this quote is on her dress, she wears a body. And I have decided to use this quotation because my starting point in the analysis of the short story by Angela Carter is the consideration that even if the body has been at the center of research across a, a, a range of social science, uh, science discipline for a while now, and even if there has been a growing interest in the cultural meaning of clothing, curiously, the relationship between dress and the body has been relatively unexplored until now. Well, I think that it is very important to work on this uh, relation. Because uh, clothing is a covering that protects yet another container, the skin itself. So if the interior covering of skin characterizes the uniqueness of the being itself, the clothing which usually makes the surface uh, of a body um, recogn recognizable within a culture and the gender, also enables that being to recognize themselves within a group, enabling, enabling them to be both one and many at the same time. Clothing thus allows the performance of an identity, an identity which is always the result of negotiations, both conscious and unconscious, between, between individuals and society, the private and the public. So the idea I will use in my analysis is that dress constitutes both a social and psychological skin, a second skin that covers the body. And it is also important to describe the body, lowered for centuries to the status of a biological vessel in which the human social agent happens uh, to reside. So it is, is that uh, important to describe um, the body 
an active role in human intersection, interaction and to recognize how the body is, in turn, shaped by society. society. Biological, and um, here you have um, some references to scholars who um, have worked on the um, relationship between body and facial cell. So we won't have focused their attention on this um, relationship, that which, as said, um, is um, relatively uh, unexplored. So, um, <clears throat> Um, biological tissue and in particular uh, the skin, perhaps the most significant region of the body in terms of human identity and identification, are so saturated by social signifiers that we can consider the skin as embodiment of identity, a mirror of physical and mental states, an indicator of individual and social status. As Nile Bani illustrates, it is the porousness of the skin surface which creates an immediate connection with the social environment, allowing, as you can read here, so as you could, uh, allowing us to think about the unstable borders between bodies that are always already crisscrossed by differences that refuse to be contained on the inside or the outside of bodies themselves. In this way, the skin becomes a liminal zone which functions as an interface between our self and the world, playing a fundamental role in social identity and identification. In fact, the ways in which individuals adorn and manipulate the skin can themselves be considered as a means of indicating group or individual identity, cohesion and different. The body and specifically the skin, can thus be seen as the first clothing that changes naturally over time and in response to individual, social and cultural transformation and stimuli. Body appearance counts and Robert Post um, ascribes the necessity to mask or manipulate the outer surface of the body to the consciousness that, and I quote, the presentation of appearances in everyday life is not merely a matter of the external surfaces of the self, for appearances are also connected to identity. Physical appearance is so connected to, to identity that our manner of appearing is our manner of being. The mask is the face. In proposing clothing as second skin and skin as first clothing, I intertwine two distinct theoretical strands. One focuses on the concept of skin and its important role as idiom um, of personhood and identity, and the other focuses on the notion of the dress body, its political power, and the manner in which clothing acts as a form of embodiment. So these theoretical strands return in, will return in my analysis of the short story Tiger's Bride, which is, as said, a contemporary retelling of Beauty and the Beast, included in The Bloody Chamber and other stories by Angela Carter. So, um, in The Bloody Chamber, um, we encounter some of the best known stories in Western literature, fairy tales by Perrault, by the Brothers Grimm, twisted into extraordinary new shapes. The collection, published in 1979 by Angela Carter, it is, was uh, Carter's um, ninth books of fiction, and one channels of uh, fairy tales and myths run um, across um, through, through her prior works. Nowhere does uh, Carter engage with those genres so directly and so intensively and so disruptively as here and the, as in this collection. The journalist and uh, critical owner Sage a close friend of Angela Carter and an acute reader of her work, describes how throughout the 1970s, uh, Carter became more um, explicitly and systematically interested in narrative modes that predate the novel fairy tale, folk tale, and other forms that develop by accretion and retelling. And as Angela Carter herself made clear, my intention was not to do versions or, as the American edition of the book said, horribly ordered fairy tales, 
but to extract latent content from the traditional stories and to use it at the beginning of new stories. So you have here, so it is Carter herself, who defines um, the aim of, of her retelling of the, the short story. And here you have these, um, uh, uh, the, the short stories which are part uh, of the book and you have uh, the, the, the correspondence with the original uh, fairy tales. So the Bloody Chamber, the Bloody Chamber is the title of the collection, but it is also the title of the first short story, Blue Beard, and The Courtship of Mr. Lion and the Tiger's Bride, Beauty and the Beast, and so on and so forth. So the approach of Angela Carter, so this idea of retelling a short story was not new. Uh, for example, in 1969, Robert Coover rewrote Little Red Riding Hood and Ansel and Gretel in his collection of Prick Song and the Scum. Two years later, the poet Anne Sexton published a horror vision of fairy tales, transformations, and in 1976 came Bruno, Bruno Betterheim's Freud in Analysis of Fairy Tales. So this is a, a theoretical book, The Uses of Enchantment. So earlier in the century, meanwhile, the Danish writer Karen Blixen had, had written a, a sequence of uh, complex Gothic variants on Northern European folks, uh, folk modes, and these stories should rightly be considered forerunners uh, to the bloody chamber. But if Carter's point of origin was far from unique, her destination would prove to be uh, unique, I think. So, in fact, Carter codified in an emblematic way the idea of a postmodern revision of the fairy tale. The postmodern transformation of fairy tales operates to different degrees, generating new solutions to be used when interpreting and decoding their um, contents. So, as you can read in the part in Born, other um, postmodern tales expose the fairy tales' compl complicity with the exhausted forms and the ideology of traditional Western narrative, and this is precisely what Carter uh, does, rewriting uh, the tale of magic in order to question and recreate the rules of narrative production, especially as such rules contribute to naturalizing subjectivity and gender. Many fairy tales have been passed down from generation to generation, recording customs and values of different cultures. These stories are presented and still to represent a means to which uh, people taught and teach children social norms and behaviors. They were, and still are, memorized in order to pass on tradition and codes of conduct. To teach roles, um, everyone should play in society, adapting them to the present time. So, in, same, in the same way, fairy tale represents a means through which long-term changes in society can be analyzed. They can also provide a critical insight into ways in which children's literature has, sh has been shaped by political and social forces over time. So, if you think about uh, um, the role of women in a traditional fairy tales, they are always they are always sleeping or waiting for the prince. So their function is to wait, to wait. But why the role of the prince is to go and rescue them? But if you think, for example, to Shrek, I don't know if you if you have seen the the, 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 the story. In that case, the situation is turned upside down because the princess is very active. Uh, the, the, the prince is far from being the, from embodying the figure of the prince because he is a dwarf. The real uh, prince is uh, prince um, is Shrek, so he is a monster. And the princess herself is um, a beautiful princess uh, during the day, but a monster in the night. Uh, I think so. As you see, this is an example of a deconstruction or. Um, the result of a reading of uh, a fairy tale. So what Shrek uh, does is pre pre precisely to question the, um, the construction of roles uh, and of gender roles which are uh, in fact present uh, in traditional um, fairy tales. And uh, it is what 
uh, Angela Carter does in her uh, rewriting uh, of, of the fairy tale. So, the success that characterizes fairy tales includes the possibility to reread, rewrite, and reinterpret both the narrative content and the speculation about gender mainly. To this respect, Bakilega, Bakilega is a um, um, famous scholar who works on, uh, on mainly on postmodern readings of fairy tales. Rereading is the magic uh, key to rewriting. It involves that substantive, uh, though di a diverse questioning of both narrative construction and assumptions about gender. Postmodern revision is often twofold, seeking to expose, make visible the fairy tale's complicity with, as I said before, exhaustive narrative and gender ideology. Seeking to expose, bring out what the institutionalization of such tales for children has forgotten or left unex uh, unexploited. So, back to Carter now. In 19... In so, uh, 1977, Carter published her own translation of Charles Perrault fairy tales, and by retelling these tales, um, writes um, saying Carter was delib deliberately, no, I do not have to put it, so was deliberately drawing them out of shape. The monsters and the princesses lose their places in the old script and cross forbidden boundary, uh, boundary lines. So, as I have previously pointed out, the aim of the postmodern readings of fairy tales is to create doubts, to destroy shared certainties about the relationship between the sexes and about the social role, and as, as far as sexual um, and gender identity is concerned, to consider um, it um, as something produced by historically and socially determined conventions rather than as something natural and biologically uh, determined. So this deconstruction and subversive approach is typical of Carter, who, as many contemporary feminist writers, use the narrative tradition of fairy tales in order to refuse to obey their authority by revising and appropriating them. Carter's story um, epitomized many of the characteristics that leading critics of a uh, postmodern novel have underlined. They present elements of parody, playfulness, deconstruction, antithesis, elimination of the borders, and decentering. Carter plays with the fairy tale genre by mixing its elements, by puzzling the reader with the enigmatic insertion, by subverting the structure of the, fairy, of the classic fairy tale. So, if uh, adaptation always involves inexpropriation and appropriation, Carter's aim in her appropriation of, of the past is to engage in a creative dialogue with tradition to show the unending revival of the past, of past codes. So, tradition is revised, re-echoed, reformulated, thus, thus allowing further transformations. And for Carter, this implies First of all, and now we have the quotation, um, an attentive act of reading. C uh, Carter says, reading is just as creative an, acti an activity as writing, and most intellectual development depends upon new readings of old texts. I'm all for putting new wine in old bottles, especially if the pressure of the new wines makes the old bottles explode. So, uh, again. Um, um, the power of women to describe her um, aims. Thus, for Carter, reading is writing. She wants to play with the genre and deconstruct the genre, make fun of its codes by solic uh, soliciting a different response from an old, old audience. Okay, and now let's move to, to the third part and my analysis of uh, The Tiger's Bride. <clears throat> So, I will now focus on the tiger's pride and on the idea of both body and skin and the uh, dressing body um, and the dress body as telling uh, traces of the cultural negotiation of identity and difference by analyzing the transformation of beauty into an animal and the figure of the beast as a strange being in a, in a dimension between human and animal. So, it is, um, my um, focus is precisely on, on this transformation. 
And in fact, it is the movement of these bodies, naked, clothed, um, clothed and masked, in a liminal zone that makes them the destroyers of the rules of normalcy. In the Tiger's Bride, Carter not only describes the restrictions created by a patriarchal society that separates the body, the mind, and the natural world from each other, as many literary critics have already pointed out, but she also portrays in between bodies and there are incessant transformations in order to deconstruct the normative um, perspective of a biopolitics <coughs> defined by uh, Michel Foucault as the extension of state control over both the physical and the political bodies of a population. If what is at stake in biopolitics uh, biopolitics is the supervision of the species body, and I'm not uh, going to read the quotation, then the points of resistance to biopolitics itself are not to be found in discussions of morals, rights, or form of civilization, but instead in the bodies themselves as signs of freedom and desire. For the Italian philosopher Angela Putino, it is therefore necessary to, to free, to unbound these in-between bodies in order to allow them a new encounter with the not yet imagined, with the beyond. Biopolitics, in fact, distributes bodies in space according to their function, according to their tasks, and in so doing, it forces them to recognize themselves in a static, fixed identity, in static, fixed identities. But, um, and I'm using here um, Putino's reasoning, bodies should be considered as undefined spaces. And uh, in the, the short story of Angela Carter, the bodies of beauty and the beast are the beyond, the unknown, and the potential for rebellion inherent in the ambiguity of their um, sexuality. Um, and um, th this potential uh, of rebellion inherent in the ambiguity of their uh, sexuality is invalidated whenever sexual difference presented by biopolitics as a, a general binary um, male-female um, body property functions of a model. So on the one hand, we have the potential of resistance, or resistance, or resistance which is um, represented by the body, by the unusual bodies of beauty and the beast. And on the other, we have the other uh, part, that is to say, this uh, imposition of um, a general bi uh, binary body property and the attempt to create it as a model. And Carter obviously resists to this idea. So in her postmodern fairy tale, Carter deconstructs, first of all, what Putino defines and denounces as si systemic dissents or systems of, uh, of meaning which traps bodies in the dimension of a readable self. What, what uh, Carter wants to do is precisely to destroy this idea of the readable self, because the readable self uh, doesn't allow us to perceive the beyond. And in order to deconstruct the biopolitical imposition and order, we have to try and go beyond. And then, uh, fairy tale deconstructs um, the idea of um, clothing as an important element in the creation and preservation of a bipolar world of gendered inequality. So this is the reason why I think that our fashion studies are important here, because uh, she, Carter, uses uh, clothing and skin in order to try and, de and deconstruct the role that usually um, uh, clothing has, that is to say, the role of reinforcing and preserving this bipolar world of gendered inequality. And uh, as said, uh, Carter offers us in between bodies which unveil the violence behind the constructiveness of sex and gender. And in this um, context, the critical lens of fashion uh, studies allows us to perceive in the short story with its veiled focus on transvestism and gender performativity, and I will return to this to, uh, concept, 
an anticipation of the idea of the fashionability of gender and of queer positions in the, polity of, in the politics of gender identity. To, to this end, let's consider how Carter undresses the fairy tale in order to construct an erotic universe for the tiger's bride aimed at the exploration of blurred and overlapping identities. The sentence uh, which opens um, the tale reveals in few powerful words the unequal relation among its three main characters. My father lost me to the beast at cards. So this strange triangle introduces a male object, my father, a female object, me. Well, being a grammatical object is a symbolic allusion to the objectification of the female character, and this objectification of the female character is further highlighted by her absence of the name. In fact, I'm calling her beauty because uh, I'm using uh, the, the name used uh, in the original fairy tale, but the female character in the fairy tale uh, written by Angela Carter has, uh, doesn't have a name. So, um, so we have the father, we have um, beauty, and, um, um, and then we have another being, the beast. And uh, the beast seems to belong to a strange dimension between human and animal. So in, in other words, from, from the very first sentence, the story presents an identity, that of the father, which is a fixed category and the paternal role determined by the definition of, of a society. Then we have an, another identity, that of the female, whose namelessness underlines that she is disallowed self-identification or signification by the same society, so that is to say by the society which ratifies the role of the father. And then we have a third identity, that of the beast, which introduces the idea of fluidity and directly associates the ever-changing quality of be becoming with alterity. The alterity is here, the alterity of the beast. So this tale describes a situation in which a male subject makes his daughter an, ob an object of exchange, which he loses to a being with a well-defined social identity, because the beast is um, defined and described as an elegant withhold, but whose individual identity is fluid. So as you see since the very beginning, we have this opposition between static identities and the idea of static identity is, is connected with the, the definition of, of the society and the idea of fluidity, which is first introduced by the beast, because the beast is uh, fluid, um, is made fluid by the very fact of being half animal and half human. Let's now consider <coughs> the role fashion plays uh, into this identity game and challenge. So I start with a fashion accessory, the mirror, because when you work with fashion studies, you can obviously consider um, uh, clothing, but then you can also work on accessories of fashion, such as, for example, the role of mirror, or um, for, with um, perfume, so with all the elements which are usually connected with fashion. Miro is, in fact, a character, uh, and as you can see, it is in fact present also in this uh, picture, which enters uh, the scene silently from the, the first page uh, of uh, the story and the first sentences uh, of the story. And if you think about the role of the mirror through the course of history, so not in this story, but in general, the mirror <coughs> has occupied a unique space in social imagination. Since the reflection in a mirror is not the real object that originates, originates the reflection, but it is the replica which is present through the modality of its absence, the mirror becomes, and has often been considered throughout history, a link between the visible and the invisible dimensions. So the mirror serves as a fashion object, but above all as a perfect symbol of the redefinition of the body, a symbol of a new identity, um, a double reflection, and also a mask of uh, that identity. 
Uh, in Carter, the theme of the mirror is very present and it represents a crucial element connected to the formation of identity. In particular, the recurring images um, um, reflected in the mirror highlight both the patriarchal hostility of the mirror to female subjectivity and the ways in which the mirror can support the development of that subjectivity. And this idea of the mirror with this double aspect is present in, in many stories in the collection at the Bradley Chamber. Uh, the mirrors in the bloody chamber allow women to understand how they themselves being fully enveloped in a patriarchal culture end up identifying not with their own true reflection but with the images of themselves as perceived by others. Reinforcing the idea that the female image is the product of a male perception consciously adopted by women themselves, the implicit criticism is that women are accomplices in presenting themselves and their bodies as objects of visions. And from the very beginning of The Tiger's Bride, beauty, which is most of her story, unfold in mirrors, and then she relates uh, the story to us. So this um, allows beauty to be both subject and object at the same time of her own narration. The mirror, uh, present in the narration also reflects the reaffirmation and transformation of the female identity of beauty. In this sense, it is uh, interesting to analyze the role of the small, opaque looking glass um, offered to beauty by her clockwork twin. So the clockwork uh, twin is a, a mechanical maid servant. She is a simulacrum of, of her mistress. She and is described by Carter as a soubrette from an opera with glossy nut brown curls, rosy cheeks, blue rolling eyes, wearing a little cap, white stockings, and frilled petticoats. The mirror presented by the maid servant, who is also um, in the first part of, of the short story, uh, a double of, um, of beauty. So this mirror reflects as uh, beauty notes not my own face, but the face of my father. Beauty sees in the mirror the face of, uh, of her father, first, uh, first of all, because in fairy tales, mirrors are magical, as you know, and they reveal events otherwise unable to be seen, but then because that reflection alludes to her status in the patriarchal world, where both her social and sexual identity are an extension of her father. I would like to suggest, however, another level of interpretation. And in order to introduce this level of interpretation, I will first mention the consideration that Labelle um, makes on the temporal aspect of the female mirror gazing. When... Uh, when a woman um, looks at her reflected image, it is often difficult for her to avoid two other faces besides the one existing in the present tense. What she has seen before in the mirror and what she hopes or fears she will see in the future. So the future face Labelle refers to is certainly the aged face of a woman. and. Um, but I believe that we can reasonably suppose that this future phase, full of hopes and fears, alludes, all, alludes also, in the specific case of the Tiger Sprite, to the male aspect of beauty. So, in this sense, beauty's boundary-breaking, metaphoric male transvestism would allow her to split herself into a double gender being. So, I think that we can read um, so after have a, having read the, the whole uh, short story, so being conscious of the very ending of the short story, in which clearly this, there, are, there is this idea of fluidity of identity, so we can consider the male face that Luki, um, that beauty sees in the mirror, not only uh, an image connected with the patriarchal power, but also an image which in a way destroys the patriarchal power because 
beauty sees her male part reflected in into the mirror and this is the reason why I have used this word of this expression male metaphoric trans, uh, transvestism because we have um, her transformation or the assumption of another part of her identity. So here the theme of transvestism transgresses the norm that imprisons the masculine and the feminine in established code of behavior and shapes a dynamic identity that calls our attention to the very contingency of gender normativity. So now I will consider um, another um, element which is um, again connected with the fashion and so the figure of the male uh, servant, so the, the female figure, Wolf's beauty, this looking up glass full of, of opportunities. Um, and this male servant is described by Carter as beauty's mechanical simulacrum. And I will use here the critical position of Jean Baudrillard and Anna Haraway to offer a symbolic interpretation of this figure. In Baudrillard's view, the simulacrum precedes and determines the real world. So according to Baudrillard, when it comes to postmodern simulacra and simulation, it is no longer a question of imitation or duplication, nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the signs of the real for the real. So in the Tiger's Pride, the soubrette costume worn by beauty simulacrum clearly displays an hyperbolic and stereotyped version of the feminine appearance and thus expose gender stereotypes to ridicule. We can therefore formulate the hypothesis that the maid servant, a replacement for the real that precedes the real, anticipates beauty's evolution of identity and that her mechanical appearance indicates that that evolution of identity is in fact moving away from the efforts of biopolitics to categorize it. So the maid simulacrum is mechanical. She is an example of that cyborg to whom in her well-known article as a manifesto for cyborg, Dana Haraway assigns a central role in a world without gender. According to Haraway, a cyborg is a free creature in a post-gender world, which teaches human beings to consider the partial fluid aspect of sex and sexual environment, thus making way for a wide range of post-gendered possibilities. Beauty's identity, as the story's ending proves, is beyond the above-mentioned biopolitical logic or at least it passes not without fear over the threshold of this um, logic. So the first time uh, analyzed um, above in which um, beauty sees uh, her, uh, the reflection of her masculine self into the small looking glass, she receives this reflection with um, an astonished fright. It is the anguish and fear of being labeled as a deviant subject. So in the description offered by Carter, we have this idea of perceiving what I have considered as her main part, but uh, beauty perceives uh, this new image of her self and of her identity with fear. And as said, this is the fear that um, that uh, um, a woman um, feels in the very moment in which the mirror reflects an image which is the not which is not the image usually accepted by in the society. So it is the fear of being labeled as a deviant a subject. Um, so um, beauty is in fact at the beginning of the short story biopolitically conditioned to the importance of biologic and rigid categories of gender and it is only the second time that she peers into the looking glass in the midst of its magic uh, fits again that she is able to observe the temporary assertion of her female self and accept the logic of a fluid identity. And it is also significant that the first time uh, beauty overcame her um, fright thanks to the help of the valet who took the mirror away from me, breathed it on it, polished it with uh, the hem of his glowed fist, 
and handed it back to me. The Valet Globe Fist takes on a symbolic value in the quotation again, and we have another accessory of fashion here. In the realm of fashion, globes are linked to the threshold between the internal and the external. In one way, they evoke the presence of the hand they cover, and in another way, they express social integration and are inserted into the system of conventions ruling collective uh, interrelations. In Carter's tale, the globe symbolizes the conformity to the social space through which the subject moves. So the globe, the globe becomes an accessory which alludes to formality and convention. The globe makes the figure of the valet a male representative of the, of the patriarchal system who reaffirms the rich distinction between two genders. And in fact, after the, the, the valet hands, the valet hands the looking glass back, beauty is momentarily reassured by seeing only her familiar feminine reflection into the mirror, noting that now I saw, now all I saw was myself. So the, the function of the patriarchal system in order to try and um, recreate the, the original situation and, um, and the, the, the reaction of beauty. Therefore, the opacity of the mirror into which beauty gazes symbolizes the potential fluidity and nomadic gender identity that has to be polished by the biological power, read the valet, in order to pass off socially constructed categories of identity and gender as innate and ontologically given. So the factors that I have analyzed so far, the globe and the mirror in connection with the fixed fluid identity and uh, beauty's, male metaphoric, uh, beauty's metaphoric male transvestism show that both femininity and masculinity are constructed as masks, as layers which conceal no identity. Since the dominant culture identifies men and women with their clothing and expects masculinity and femininity to be written on the body, femininity, femininity itself as the natural wearer of feminine clothing and masculinity itself as the natural wearer of masculine clothing become masks um, which through clothing are either molded by a voluntarily act or perceived as mandatory in order to represent oneself in order to represent oneself. In fact, beauty, having returned uh, to the palace after a long and cathartic gallop with the beast, uh, on which I will return soon, and having it, and having stripped off her riding habit, confesses. I was so unaccustomed to nakedness, I was so unused to my own skin, that to take off all my clothes involved a kind of flaying. Flaying is to strip the skin off. So in taking off her clothes, beauty is liberating herself metaphorically, shedding her own clothes, skin. Her clothing and identity are here so intertwined that taking off clothes involves a kind of flaying. So if dress serves to underline sexual, sexual gender differences, by taking off her riding habit, beauty takes back her original nature, refusing, refusing to, afford, uh, to assume a form not belonging to her. Having decided to remain in the fluid world of the, of the beast, Beauty dresses the mechanical maid servant in her riding habit, and then she sends um, the mechanical servants in a, in a, in Beauty's place to perform to perform the part of his father's uh, daughter. So her, her mechanical simulacrum here no longer resembles her, and in fact, um, Angela Carter writes her face was no longer the spit of mine, because beauty has rejected the patriarchal stereotypes she now vests in her simulacrum.
Her, uh, her act of flaying herself of clothes skin follows, but in time and as goes, the strip this posed initially as the beast as the condition for setting her free and eventually performed by beauty out of her real desire. The beast, in fact, uh, shortly after winning um, Beauty at Card, did take a condition under which she, uh, he will uh, give beauty back to his father. The beast's only condition is to see the pretty lady unclothed, nude, without her dress, and that only for one time. However, this fact will not uh, end up by being fulfilled in the story, respecting the condition dictated by the beast. In fact, it is the beast who, during their uh, ride, asks Beauty if he can be nude in front of her, thus freeing himself of his heavy human trappings and letting his strong, white animal self appear. Such a request makes the beast the object of vision and makes beauty the subject who gazes, suggesting a deconstruction of the concept of the gaze as a site of power, assuming generally assuming a male viewer and a woman being gazed upon. So as you see, we have um, again the situation is turned upside down. This new possibility of an active female vision offered to beauty destabilizes traditional gender formation and presents new ways of thinking about gender, corporeality, vision and desire. This new active desire guides beauty to unfasten her jacket, so we have her voluntary uh, striptease, and to show the beast her white skin and her red nipples. Beauty's undressing in, um, beauty's undressing in order to evoke, no sorry, I have used the word striptease in order to describe uh, the undressing of beauty, in order to evoke with positive connotation that desexualization which Roland Barthes um, evokes in mythologies and which uh, he uh, links to striptease and describes as extremely contradictory. Uh, Barth writes, a woman is desexualized at the very moment when she is stripped naked. If for Bart the end of the striptease is to signify through the shedding of an incongruous and artificial clothing nakedness as a natural vesture of woman, um, which amounts in the end to re regaining a perfectly chaste state of the flesh, in Carter's tale, beauty's desexualization Far, far from taming a female eroticism, instead deconstructs the representation of desire offered by the binary model of gender difference. Another character and further suggestions, and I'm, um, I'm at more or less at the end, uh, the beast. The beast, as beauty tells us, is an animal masked as a man. So, as you can read uh, in this quotation, uh, in which um, Beauty describes the beast, um, mm, Beauty describes the uncanniness of the beast, but um, Beauty's words referring to the uncanniness of the beast are not referred to the animal form, but to the perfect symmetry of the mask of the human carnivalesque aspect that overturns the usual uh, cognitive categories that define people. So the beast is uncanny, but the beast is uncanny not because of um, his animal aspect, but because this mask of uh, humanity, if, if we want to, 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 to say so. So by uniting within himself the signs of his being both non-human and human, the beast overturns the semantic system which constitutes the verbal knowledge of the word um, as a society, of the word that uh, society has uh, given uh, the word itself. So if in the case of beauty we can consider beauty's elegant and composed feminine image as a symbolic mask, the clothes from which uh, beauty ritually uh, flays herself, in the case of the beast, 
his human aspect is pure masking and real transvestism. So the function of the transvestism of the beast is primarily to pass himself off as a human person in order to guarantee himself all the social advantages from being recognized as part of a human society. In fact, dress from antiquity has been designed to bring order to human social life, to create and define a public face or persona, and here I'm using the original, the, the, the original meaning of the word persona, as you know, the etymological origin of the word persona is connected with the mask. In fact, the persona was uh, the mask used by the actors in the Roman theater in order to to reinforce their, their voice. And uh, in this idea of the mask trace is connected to the idea of persona as we use it today because um, our persona is the social mask that we wear in order to be accepted by, by the society. So um, the, um, this mask, uh, in the case of the beast, makes uh, the beast a carnival figure made of papier mache and crab hair. So these words evokes the theoretical debate on the carnival and the carnivalesque from Bakhtin uh, to Foucault to Kristeva, intertwining with different uh, shades of meaning and critical stances, identity and society, and bending and deconstructing this concept in the subversive confusion of the carnivalesque. And, uh, of particular interest in the development of my analysis are the reflection of Mary Russo in considering Bakhtin's concept of the carnival. The masks and voices of carnival resist, exaggerate and destabilize the distinctions and boundaries that mark and maintain organized society. Carnival can be seen above all as a site of insurgency. Therefore, the beast Carnivalesque transvestism becomes both a space of concealment and a space of revelation with respect to organized society. As a space of concealment, the mask denounces a perception of identity connected with the crucial consideration of oneself by others. The mask the person then and thereafter presents to the world and to the citizenship of the world is fashioned upon his or her anticipation of their judgment. So from this perspe perspective, the identity and the body of the beast made public by the, the mask is the, so the social de declaration of the body conscious of a mediation and of the necessity of a mediation with the social system. Then the mask can also be conceived as a space of revelation, a revelation that can only uh, take place after the subject conscious mediation with the social system. Um, so by recognizing that the body is not uh, a natural entity within the world of culturally produced realities, a space of revelation is opened up for a, res a discursive resistance to socially constructed norms of, of identification. And so the beast mask body becomes the site of an extremely disruptive revelation for a body politics and the legal system that struggled to accommodate it. Following Clarissa Pincola's line of reasoning, according to which an archetypal symbolism clothing represents persona, persona um, with the meaning um, I have already um, uh, clarified, um, I would now consider the subversive potential hidden behind the clothes mask that uh, the beast chooses to wear. So I will now focus on the, the beast's way of clothing. So within the normative system that defines and disciplines gender through social representation, among which, for example, is the adoption of a certain style of clothing, male dress has long served to signal assert and reinforce the boundary between male, men and women, and between masculinity and femininity. And throughout social and literary history, masculinity, therefore, has often been symbolized by trousers. 
And um, this uh, conventional and ambiguous uh, signal of masculinity is called into question from the very beginning of the Tiger's Prime by the style of dress adopted by the Beast. In the short story, trousers are not mentioned. The Beast, in fact, wears a garment of Ottoman design, a loose, dull purple gown with gold embroidery around the neck, or he is wrapped in a black fur lined cloak. So, as you see, the, um, the, um, uh, the, um, the element for, um, for, for excellence uh, which defines masculinity is not present here. So the absence of trousers and the subsequent choice of a, a gender neutral uh, clothing turn out to be, in my interpretation, the repeated acts, um, uh, series of acts and gestures a la Butler that the beast employs as a site of revelation of the unreliable nature of clothes as identity markers in the service of the system of compulsory heterosexuality. Appending what that which uh, Garber serves in her exploration of the nature and significance of transvestism, I would conversely suggest that the beast uh, is not interested in gender marked and gender-coded identity structures, and um, the beast instead, through his clothes and mask, refuses the need to clearly define and be defined, and he celebrates the significance um, of a degendered and metagendered subject whose outlaw fluidity allows um, him or it to go beyond the nature of male, female, to a yet to be a region that lies somewhere between uh, and beyond biological determined gender. And I'm concluding now. Um, so the, the short story ends, ends by offering us the precise fantasy of a place for a nomadic gender identity where the bodies of beauty and the beast can join. Such an encounter creates an uncommon space for a dance across the threshold of a degendered and the gender viability, moving toward new pathways far from the normativizing of society. Um, Beauty says, he dragged himself closer and closer to me until I felt the harsh velvet of his head against my hand, the tongue abrasive as sandpaper. Sand he will lick the skin off me and each stroke of his tongue ripped off skin after successive skin and all the skins of life in the world and left behind a nascent patina of shining hairs, I shrugged the drops of my beautiful fur. So the beast's abrasive tongue frees beauty of overlapping layers of skin clothes, making real the flame that beauty fantasizes earlier in the story. The cultural costume of which beauty is liberated is actually her own skin, and her identity and nature as a body beyond reappears not only metaphorically, but also in her transformation from woman to tiger. Her metamorphosis brings on the effective um, otherness represented by the animal fur that now covers, covers beauty, an otherness that has neither name nor identity. So according to classic feminist interpretation, beauty stripping off her various layers of identity allows beauty to free herself from the culture made skin that doesn't fit and to let her female animal nature emerge understood to be the genuine basic essence of each woman. In concluding my reading of the tale, I would suggest that this soul skin could also act to unveil that fluid and versatile third who question the third is the in-between human and animal, because now she's a tiger as the beast, uh, um, as the beast is an animal. So, um, this um, allows to, to, to unveil that fluid and versatile third to questions and defies the bio biopolitical logic of binary thinking. Beauty, neither woman nor beast, yet woman and beast, 
opens up a space of possibilities that questions the idea of one fixed identity and of two sexual identities. I believe that far from fictional um, reflections of Angela, um, that from the fictional reflection of Angela Carter arises the incitement to acknowledge the complexity and multiplicity of human identity, knowing that identity cannot be understood as what we are, the multiple overlapping categories that make us into subject, rather we are what we do and what we make, we are what we generate, which may give us identity, but always an identity that is directed to our next act, our next activity, rather than to the creation of the categories that may serve to describe us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm at a loss for words because uh, that was very dense and very stimulating, and um, it's, um, I don't know, um, I have, a, I, obviously I have a few questions, but maybe I don't want to steal the floor, so if some of you have questions that they want to ask Chiara, maybe I will uh, uh, intervene afterwards, it's up to you. Yes, uh, Stephanie, thank you. Yes, um, as uh, I knew that we were going to talk about fashion when I read the story this morning, my attention was limited to be drawn to the references to fashion in the story. And I was wondering how, what you would make actually of the three references to fashion that you can find. Uh, can you expect to get that question, but, oh, sorry, that, can you go on a little bit? No, it's just if you can... My son has COVID. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, you keep it on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, it says at one stage that uh, the valet is giving the heroine an old-fashioned look. Uh, the beast is wearing a wig of the kind you see in old-fashioned portraits. And then it's, um, it says at the beginning that she finds herself in a place that has been out of fashion 200 years. So each time, what is actually being emphasized is the fact that she, she's in a place that is old-fashioned or out of fashion, and the beast himself is associated with something from, you know, dating back from a long time ago. So, I, I, I don't know how this would tie in with your interpretation, what you would make it. Um, so, you, you, you think that raised uh, this emphasis and this connection with the past? Uh? Yeah. Uh, um, obviously, we are dealing with a, a fairy tale, so as, as, as we know, and as we, you, you know, um, when dealing with fairy tale, they are. In, in a sort of mythical past, so these, these are the connection with the past, but the idea of the presence of the past and the idea of this um, fairy tale past um, is um, at the same time deconstructed by the description of, for example, a mechanical maid servant, which is usually not connected with the uh, classical fairy tale. So I, I would say that this emphasis with uh, the past is not connected with my perception of fashion and this deconstruction of the idea of gender and this idea of fluid identity. Um, but it is, uh, in my perception, more um, present and there in order to describe this um, mythical past, which is a part of, of the fairy tales and which, which as said, is um, present in each, um, in each uh, short story by Carter, but at the same time present and uh, deconstructed uh, by, uh, by Carter. Um, what do you think about it? I'm going to ask my question. Um, I was very interested in uh, what you said, though I didn't know anything about fashion studies. I mean, I could guess a little, but, uh, but what is interesting to me is that, as I told you, um, in my PhD, I studied objects, and in, uh, including um, clothes. And uh, um, so I, I paid a lot of attention to mirrors and gloves and, and uh, obviously Gatsby's costumes, as you know. And um, what struck me is that uh, in the end, I had, um, I, I'm, my interpretation was uh, um, headed towards metafiction. Because for me, the mirror is introduces uh, metafiction into a, a narrative, 
And uh, the glove is also a very significant image. That is, there is one thing, the, the hand inside another, and it can be an image of a, a metafictional discourse. So I was wondering, this is something that you didn't say anything about, and it's funny because though I don't know it, I'm, I'm, as I told you, as I explained to you yesterday, I don't know about uh, this um, uh, fashion studies, um, I was struck by the fact that I, I, I must have done a little of it <laughs> 20 years ago when I wrote my PhD dissertation. But especially, what about metafiction that you didn't mention? Um, well, um, I haven't worked on the, the dimension of metafiction in this specific fairy tale. Mm, but, for example, the first fairy tale of the connection, um, the bloody chamber, in fact, in which we have um, the, the rereading of Bluebeard. Um, and in which we have a, a pervasive presence of, of mirrors, in fact, um, is, um, and I have read um, it in the past, a clear example not only of metafiction, but it, it is a, a, a meta fairy tale. So I think that in that specific fairy tale, um, Carter uses not only mirrors, but also other parts of the detail precisely in order to reflect on the construction of, of, of the act of uh, writing a fairy tale. So yes, uh, this idea is present. Uh, I've, I've not worked on, uh, I've not considered it in this specific tale, but it is present in Carter and in her use uh, of the mirror. Yes, because frankly speaking, I think that, um, um, as I said, uh, outside fashion studies, but in uh, if you only focus on the question of representation, and the representation of reality in fiction. All the, the um, um, costumes and accessories that refer to, to fashion, <coughs> fashion studies, are, um, um, can be considered elements, uh, re recurrent elements, recurrent signs, introducing uh, um, um, metatextuality or metafiction um, into a text. So this is what struck me. That is, all these objects that, that you mentioned as accessories or, or clothes also work as a traditional signals of uh, uh, metafictional, metatextual, depending on the context, discourse. So I think it's very interesting to see how you've got several levels of interpretation, including um, this, uh, which is typical of also of, um, of postmodernism. So um, I guess, I don't know this whole story, but it, it, it would certainly make full sense. I think so, at least. Um, yes, Stephen. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that because I actually came to the same conclusion but from a different perspective, from a different angle. I suppose both of us have been formatted in many ways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I thought that we could also uh, consider another avenue of reflection, maybe, and um, insofar as it initiates a reflection on intertextuality itself. And after all, what you said at the beginning, all these considerations about style and fashion. I mean, they also bear upon the process of writing. I know we wonder about the style, a different kind of style, of course, that you're going to adopt. You know, the fashion is it going to be popular whenever what old audience are you addressing, and so on. And, uh, and of course, retellings, rewritings are uh, nothing else than old texts dressed in a more modern garb, actually. Uh, so the body is also yeah. the body of writing that is represented by the original text, or the hypertext, text, as we call it sometimes. While the, the various layers of skin being peered off, you know, at the end, are also the many rewritings and retellings that have been given over the years. So that's the reason why I came, as I said, to a similar conclusion as yours, but metafiction or metatextuality. Now I can only add, uh, because uh, you mentioned uh, um, the idea of hypertext, uh, um, that um, I, w I was thinking about uh, hypertextual links in, in these uh, specific fairy tales precisely in the moment in which um, uh, I was reflecting on the um, clothing of the beast and this idea of wearing an Ottoman um, um, dress because um, it evoke me um, Orlando uh, by Wolf uh, in which the very moment of the transformation of Orlando is in the moment in which she, he wears uh, these uh, gypsy dresses and again the idea is the same, uh, the, the, this fluidity and so if we open the, the, the short story to the, the, the intertextual world we can have other uh, elements which are in a way connected with the, the same 
um, idea of the fluidity of, of identity. Um, I have a, a, a minor question, but um, you didn't say anything about the illustrations that you, sh you showed us. Uh, were there, did, do they come from uh, uh, new uh, editions, new versions of the... No, no, they, they were part of a version of uh, okay. the blood. So they, they were um, original illustrations for the bloody chamber. Okay, because it's very interesting. They were, I found them very interesting and, yeah. uh, and uh, I was... Uh, I, I no, part of, not all of them, but part of them were... Okay. Because well. they were, that was very interesting as well. <coughs> yeah. Um, do you have questions, guys? No? Among the students? Enough. <laughs> okay, well, cause it may be because they are tired. Cause you, 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 you've spoken for a long time. A lot. Um, so if there are no more questions, shall we call it today? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful that you're here and that you gave Chiara a proper welcome. So I'm really very welcome, very, sorry, uh, grateful to, to you all. Thank you. Yeah, and I would add thank you to you. And if you are curious and if you want some um, references on fashion studies, uh, you can uh, ask uh, Professor Pascal my email and I am very... I'm very happy to, to give you further references. Thank you.